before Nevin starts, let me just give you a, a rough outline of what uh, the project is and what we'll be telling you about tonight. So this um, is a, a project and we'll explain the process by which we've identified opportunities to repurpose existing drugs to fight the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this was done in just three short months. So it begins on the left with a technique pioneered in Nevin's lab to map how the virus hijacks human cells. He's done this for many, many viruses so far uh, and perfected those techniques so they were be able to be implemented during this pandemic. Then with the map in hand, which you see in the middle of the slide, uh, Brian's group and my group uh, have been able to identify uh, opportunities uh, of existing drugs that target the host proteins that the viral proteins interact with. And then uh, from that list of 69 drugs, 27 of which were FDA approved and 42 were in clinical trials or, or in preclinical trials, then Jacqueline and Nevin will explain how we had to go through, uh, I think, a heroic effort to bring together an international uh, set of collaborators to test these predictions, get the data back, and then interpret through Brian's uh, beautiful work how they worked uh, and how the drugs might be uh, put into the clinic. So with that as an introduction, I think Nevin will take us through in much more detail. I think we'll uh, get started. It is our uh, pleasure to present to you our uh, recently published work. Uh, it was published yesterday, a very um, international and, and highly collaborative uh, study where we generated a map or a blueprint of how a SARS-CoV uh, hijacks and rewires our cells during the course of infection. And we use that map to make predictions about uh, drugs and compounds that could be repurposed to potentially uh, help uh, fight COVID-19. And just to give you a brief overview here, as I just said, uh, we created the first ever blueprint of how SARS-2 hijacks the human cells using approximately uh, 30 viral proteins associated uh, with the virus. Using this map, we uncovered uh, two key drug classes with a high potential to uh, fight COVID-19. During the study, uh, we also identified an over-the-counter medicine that appears actually to be proviral and that it uh, uh, promotes uh, infection. And this work is spurring the initiation of uh, several clinical trials, which we're very excited about. Just to give you a sense of the timeline of uh, SARS-2 and how it relates to other coronaviruses that have been uh, very deadly in the past, uh, SARS-1 uh, emerged um, early in the century in, in 2002, MERS uh, 20 and 12, and of course, um, SARS-CoV-2 at the end of 2019. And what makes SARS-CoV-2 so much more problematic. It's not that it's the mortality rate is higher, it's actually lower. It's just that it's so much more infectious and so many more people are asymptomatic. So it's been incredibly hard to contain uh, this particular coronavirus. So in order to combat this coronavirus, uh, the Quantitative Biosciences Institute uh, at the University of California in San Francisco um, came together to start the QCRG, the QBI COVID-19 uh, Research Group which involves uh, 22 different laboratories uh, at QBI. There's actually many more labs that have been involved uh, since uh, we started this. Uh, this was a picture taken at the beginning of March. And uh, we brought together a, a really exciting, diverse set of uh, skill sets uh, to fight the problem from structural biology, chemical biology, computer scientists, and systems biology, as well as virologists to help come up with strategies to ultimately fight SARS-CoV-2. And this is a paper that was uh, recently published um, yesterday. Uh, involves uh, over 120 different scientists from around the world, uh, a, a truly international uh, uh, collaboration from uh, scientists in the United States uh, to uh, including Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, all the way to the Pasteur Institute, as well as scientists in England and San Diego and North Carolina uh, and Seattle a, as well. So it's been a, a truly exciting and collaborative uh, project, which we wanna tell you about today. So um, just to go into a little bit more detail of how we generated this map. Uh, so uh, SARS-CoV-2 has approximately 30 genes uh, and we have over 20,000 genes or proteins in our cells and this virus cannot exist by itself. Uh, it needs our cells, our genes, our proteins in order to live and replicate and infect our cells. So what we did was to clone out each one of the genes associated with the virus and put affinity tags on the individual genes, express them in uh, human cells 
pulled out these proteins, uh, this affinity tag is essentially a hook, and then we used a process called mass spectrometry to identify the human proteins that are physically interacting with, that are sticking to each one of the viral proteins to generate this virus-host interaction network. And this map now is fueling a, a great deal of hypothesis-driven research uh, in terms of the biochemistry, structural characterization of the interactions, chemical biology approaches, uh, bioinformatic uh, analysis, and really what we're doing is putting all these different type of approaches together to come up with key proteins in our cell, which we think the virus needs. Then we're perturbing them pharmacologically and seeing what effects they have in infection experiments. And then in a reiterative way, we're using that information to reinform back these uh, experimental, uh, this pipeline that I've been talking about. And we've generated these maps over the last 10, 11 years on a number of different viruses, including uh, HIV, hepatitis C, Ebola, dengue, and Zika. And normally, uh, these maps take uh, at least a couple of years to, to generate. Uh, well, we didn't have that time in this case. Uh, and uh, we generated uh, this map with SARS-CoV-2 in a matter of weeks. And to me, that was a testament to the, the, the collaborative spirit that went into this, where uh, people came together in a really unprecedented way uh, to generate this map and uh, extract hypotheses about it in terms of uh, potential drug repurposing. And just to go into a little bit of the details of the timeline, uh, as I think we're all well aware of, this was a virus that most of us uh, uh, did not know about uh, around Christmas, or uh, did not know much about. Uh, and uh, the first virus was identified in the United States uh, uh, in January, the middle of January. Uh, a couple of scientists in my group, uh, David Gordon and Gwendolyn Jang, uh, started to clone out these uh, genes um, at the end of uh, January, we generated our first draft host um, viral interaction map uh, in the beginning of March. Uh, middle of March, uh, Kayvon and Shoykat and Brian Shoykat sent out drugs and compounds to our collaborators in New York and Paris, which had the virus propagating there. We did not have the virus growing in our lab as of yet in, in San Francisco. There's Todd, the FedEx guy, a hero here in the story. He, was, he came in regularly to send out these uh, drugs and compounds to our collaborators. Um, shortly thereafter, there was a shelter in place in San Francisco. We had just collected the last bit of our data to generate this map just before the shelter in place uh, went into effect. We published our work in the open access journal BioArchive near the end of March. And um, another thing to say is that we've um, cloned out these genes and sent them to many different laboratories around the world, which I'm going to uh, talk about in just a few uh, slides. And uh, one of the novelties here uh, in terms of what we're doing is we're trying to target the host factors in terms of coming up a, with a novel therapeutic strategy. There's, most groups are trying to find drugs or compounds to target the virus, and, and that's a great approach. We're taking a different approach. We're trying to identify the human proteins that the virus needs, try to come up with a drug or a compound to inhibit those proteins um, through drug repurposing efforts, at least um, initially, and hopefully in the future, um, with combinatorial approaches, maybe one of our drugs or compounds could be used in combination with an antiviral drug, such as remdesivir, uh, that's presently being used in a cocktail, and uh, maybe that will be a powerful treatment in, in going forward in the future. So here's a look at the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. Uh, so in total, we have predicted that there's 29 genes associated with the virus. Uh, there's 16 non-structural proteins, four structural proteins in red there, and then we predict but there's these very interesting accessory factors um, that we initially had predicted uh, that there's nine. So in total, we're looking at 29 different um, genes, and we isolated each one of those genes and put affinity tag on each one of those and expressed those in human cells and then purified, as I said before, each one of the viral proteins with the affinity tag, analyzed the material by mass spectrometry, and then used algorithms that we and others have developed over the years to come up with a high-confidence SARS-CoV-2 human protein-protein uh, interaction map. And these clones that I uh, talked about previously, um, we actually have sent them out around the world over the last few weeks to 314 different laboratories in 38 countries, ignoring all material transfer agreements. These are agreements that normally take months to put into place. We just ignored that in an effort to expedite research on um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, um, and you can see actually these plasmids spread around the world faster than the virus did in an attempt to uh, come up with treatments uh, for this pandemic. 
So here's the map that we uh, reported on um, yesterday. Uh, it is 332 uh, SARS-CoV-2 human protein-protein interactions, including 69 druggable host proteins. The red diamonds correspond to the viral proteins. The uh, circles correspond to the human proteins. And if the circle is a drug target, it is um, orange. And I just want to say that we work closely with Zoic Labs, um, a very exciting company here uh, in uh, the Bay Area. And they took our map and they made a very interactive version of it where people can look at, look at the details of the proteins. And we're starting now to put on top uh, the drug information uh, as well. So if you're interested in looking at this data, I'd encourage you to look uh, at our paper and find the link for this map. And there's a number of global analyses that we've uh, been doing here with these 332 proteins, um, comparing them to gene ontology, uh, looking at different expression of these genes uh, and proteins in different tissues, comparing it to other data that other groups have been generating uh, in the context of a SARS-2 infection, and then comparing these to other viral networks uh, that we and others have um, identified over the last uh, several years to try to find commonalities. And I just want to show you one uh, analysis that I think is particularly interesting. So we took the 332 proteins uh, and we looked at RNA expression data across every single human tissue that's been analyzed. And we found that the 332 proteins collectively are most highly expressed in lung cells. Even though we're looking in HEC-293 cells, those are kidney cells to generate the map, we identified a set of proteins that are most highly expressed in lung cells, which gives us great confidence that we identified a high confidence protein-protein uh, interaction data set. Interestingly here, the, the second highest enrichment is in testes, and um, there's actually some evidence to suggest that the virus can actually uh, infect testy cell lines, and this is work that's ongoing with our collaborators in New York. Nevin, all the process you just described, we call that systems biology, right? I, I think maybe it'd be good to give the audience just a one-minute primer on systems biology and, and how it was in play here. So the work uh, that I've uh, described to date, I think, is an excellent example of a systems biology. Uh, more traditional science is, is really looking at it, science at a reductionist view. Um, people often just look at one gene or one protein or just one, maybe one protein complex. Um, we're doing science a little differently. We're identifying a set of genes linked to a disease, in this case, all the genes associated with the SARS-2 virus, and globally looking in an unbiased way at all the human proteins that are physically associated with it. And now we've generated this big map. We go deep to study uh, one protein or one connection between two proteins in a very mechanistic way. And the idea is you go back and forth between these large-scale views and these more detailed mechanistic views in order to understand the biology behind uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, infection. And in my mind, um, that's how systems biology, uh, or at least successful si systems biology, should be done. Okay, uh, so I, maybe I'll take over for a few slides. My name is Brian Schuchat, uh, and I'm going to introduce the drug discovery aspect of this, which uh, Kayvon will speak on at a greater length. Uh, and I, I, I thought just to begin with, I'd take you through um, a few key points about how drugs work. Uh, so I'll take you through the nature and mechanisms. Of, so what are drugs and what are they doing? Um, I'll take you through the costs and success rates of, of drug development. And, and that'll get back to something that Nevin alluded to. You know, we didn't have time in this project to do things in the normal way. And that's you know, quadruply true for the drug side, where normal drug development takes, you know, over a decade usually, and we felt like we had months, so we had to uh, uh, adopt another approach. Um, I'll take you through drug side effects because they're important for understanding drug action and for the limits on on how high we can take drugs in the body, but they're also important for something we we exploited in this project, which is sometimes the side effects uh, uh, for one use of a drug are an opportunity for another use of the same drug. Uh, and that's something we exploited in this project. I'll, I'll show you how that all played out for the discovery and development of um, an HCV drug, an antiviral drug called uh, Diclatisvir. It's uh, one of the brilliant successes of, of you know, molecular pharmacology drug discovery in the modern era. It was introduced five years ago. Uh, but it really sets up a counterpoint to um, 
what we have to what we had to do in this project. Um, and then I'll, then I'll introduce you know how we tried to turn the tables, sort of turning classical drug discovery on its head by repurposing existing drugs for the human proteins um, that the virus subverts. That's the material that Nevin introduced. And we try to know once we knew, once Kayvon and and you know our colleagues and, and, and our labs knew that the the human proteins that were involved, we were we they became targets for drug repurposing. So I'll take you a little bit through that. So what is a drug, right? So you get it uh, over the counter or you get a prescription for it and um, it comes in a pill. And uh, what's in that pill are um, two broad sorts of things. One are inactive ingredients called excipients. The inactivity of those ingredients is um, more um, agreed to um, than, than really known. Actually, there's a super interesting story about act, inact, so-called inactive ingredients have their own pharmacology, turns out. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the active ingredients, and those are the drugs. And and in, you know, in this uh, in in this you know uh, you know nighttime cold medicine here, there's three drugs actually. Um, the first one shown at the top is acetaminophen, the simpler one, uh, and it's drawn as chemists draw molecules. You know, so for those of you who haven't had organic chemistry recently, or whose memories of organic chemistry bring back terrible memories. Just to say that you know each each little point, each node is is an atom, and and the edges between them represent bonds. And acetaminophen is a really simple drug whose actually targets we still don't completely understand, uh, despite you know decades of use and probably billions of people. Um, Dextromethorphan is the is the so acetaminophen is is the um, that the pain relieving part of the, of this drug. Uh, Dextromethorphan, uh, which is a drug we'll come back to, um, is uh, um, the cough suppressant in this in this drug, and I'll show you why. And then doxylamine is the antihistamine, and it it you know uh, re that one reduces you know some inflammatory parts that are associated with the common cold, and it and diphenhydramine and lots of uh, first generation antihistamines like it are um, responsible for making you sleepy, um, which is something that you really want uh, in, in a nighttime. So it's not in the day. So if you look at the daytime uh, side, it, you, the, the, the antihistamine isn't there because you want to stay awake. The antihistamine is to help you th sleep through the misery of the cold. It's important to, to remember like some very fundamental things. The, the, these are mo the, the drugs are molecules and they're small, right? So Doxylamine, the antihistamine, is uh, about a nanometer in size, so 10 to the ninth meter. You know, a human is a big human. Nevin is about two meters, for instance. Kayvon and I are less. Uh, uh, and there's, a, there's about um, 10 to the 19th of these molecules per pill, right? And, you know, pill's pretty small. Um, something you can swallow. So that gives you a sense of the scale. Um, that they, they, What they do is they, you know, you swallow them. Okay, here's one of the cool things about drugs. You have to be able to deliver them, usually orally, um, although for um, coronavirus, IV treatments are, are going to be pretty common. Um, and then it's got to do this miraculous thing, or two miraculous things. The first miraculous thing is it has to get out of the gut and into the systemic circulation and lots of molecules don't and any molecule that stays in the gut is not going to have a systemic effect it might have a gut effect but it won't have a systemic effect and most drugs have to have a systemic effect so it has to it has to be have the right properties so it can get into the bloodstream and then the second thing it has to do it has it has to um, go to where it's going to have in its effect here actually for doxlamine a lot of its effect is in the in the central nervous system it's going to um, modulate these receptors like a rheostat, turning actually turning the, the partic its particular receptors down, uh, and so it has to get into the brain. So it has to get out of the gut, has to get into the brain, and then it has to do something fairly specific to one particular class of receptors. So I want to talk a little bit about side effects um, because whenever you're taking 
an effective drug, you're almost always got to consider its side effect. Um, really a molecule uh, that people say, a drug that people say has no side effects is almost always a drug that doesn't work at all. Drugs that work almost always have side effects. So here's here's doxylamine. It's, uh, it's primary target, the target, its mechanism of action target is the histamine receptor. Um, but it actually also hits uh, muscarinic receptors pretty well. It hits the sigma receptor also, which is the doxyl, uh, sorry, the dextromotorphan receptor, which I'll come back to uh, pretty well as well. And it has very little effect on this HERG receptor, which is the, this, this uh, cardiac toxicity receptor in the heart. Um, so it's, it's a pretty safe drug. Uh, at the concentrations that it's used at, but it hits these muscarinic receptors strongly enough so that you get, um, the sedation comes from the histamine receptors. That's sort of what you want. Um, don't use it when you're driving. Uh, but you'll get lurid dreams often, a little bit of tachycardia and dry mouth. And uh, anybody who's been on Benadryl, for instance, uh, diphenhydramine will, will experience similar side effects. So if you take Benadryl or any of these drugs, any of these first generation, you know, these nighttime cold medicines, basically, for long enough, and long enough doesn't have to be very long, you'll often get these lurid dreams, a little bit of tachycardia, not too bad, dry mouth, those are very common. And we understand how those come. Those are through these secondary targets that these drugs are also hitting. Um, uh, so this is um, loratadine. It was developed to overcome the side effects. So people who were, you know, had allergies and uh, and had to take antihistamines during the day and it was knocking them out, which was bad. They couldn't drive, they couldn't focus. Um, this is a miserable time. So people were motivated to develop these second generation drugs, which um, didn't get into, basically don't get into the brain as well. Loratadine is, is a great example, active ingredient in um, Claritin. Uh, because it doesn't get into the brain, you don't you don't get um, the, the, the sedation, uh, you don't get as much of the tachycardia and you don't get the lurid dreams. You still do get dry mouth. Um, right. So it was a, is a miracle drug. The next one, astemazole, was developed at the same time as loratidine, same reasons. Also meant to be a miracle drug, but there was something that people didn't anticipate. Um, it hit the HERG receptor very hard and so it had cardiac. So people actually got heart attacks and died from this drug. So it was pulled. I just want to point out that it also hits the sigma receptor. And, um, and, and, and the last one is dextromotorphan, hits the sigma receptor. It also hits the serotonin receptor, uh, which is the um, same receptor that Prozac and the uh, SSRIs hit. So the, the side effects here, you, if you take it long enough, you can get sleep disturbances and, and dependence. And this hitting the sigma receptor is something we'll come back to. It's something that dextromotorphan, you know, that's probably its mechanism. For the other drugs, it's a, it's a side effect, but one that's exploitable. Okay, I promised I'd tell you a little bit about the drug discovery pipeline. And it's important to understand this because it, it, it frames just how difficult and expensive the enterprise is. So um, from start to finish for, for classic drug discovery, if it takes less than 10 years, you're doing pretty well. And it, and it takes a long time for um, sort of two fundamental reasons. First one is developing these molecules from scratch is, is a difficult and risky enterprise. And they have to, before they ever go anywhere near a human, they have to be extensively studied preclinically um, in models of how they're going to work in the human body and then in animals as we get closer and closer to human studies. And then the human studies are super rigorous and difficult and, and I really have to be alert for safety problems because of the side effects that I, I just went over. And, and there's, they, you know, they can each phase, there's sort of three phases, three major phases, and each one can take several years. The first one can, can usually be done in nine months, but the, the second phase is, um, takes longer and the third phase takes. And, and as you go from phase to phase, you get to more and more patients enrolled in the study and they become more and more expensive. Um, and actually, the, for, for many drugs, the first time you figure out whether it's actually going to work in, in humans is in phase two, by which time you've spent, you know, 
a quarter of a billion dollars and eight years developing it maybe. So it's, it's sort of not for the faint of heart drug discovery. This is the, the other kicker. You know, um, people will tell you, that, you know, it costs, if you listen to the pharmaceutical industry, uh, $3 billion, something like that, to develop a drug. It, it actually doesn't. It doesn't cost $3 billion to develop a single drug. But the success rate, just going, once it's already gotten to clinical trials, the success rate these days is about 5%. 5% of the molecules that enter that you've already spent, you know, $100 million developing or maybe $50 million developing, uh, only 5% of those get all the way through to registration and, and, and approval from the FDA. So it, so the, when they say $3 billion, it's the integrated cost. It, it includes the 95% failure rate. And, and the later they fail, the more expensive they are. A drug that fails, an important drug, a big drug that fails in phase three can, can sink a pharmaceutical company. Okay, so here's, I just put in, try to put this all together for you. Um, the discover, uh, discovery of Decladosphere, which is really a miraculous uh, drug treating um, hep C virus, uh, uh, introduced by uh, Bristol Myers Squibb about five years ago. And uh, they started with a screen, so they initially had no molecules. So they had not, they're starting from scratch. So the way you're, that most drugs are discovered, starting from scratch. They screened over a million molecules, um, looking for ones that might have some efficacy in an antiviral assay. And they found one molecule that worked. Out of a million, they found one that really confirmed, and it's, it's shown there. And um, it's molecule two, as it's shown. And then there's this, miraculous story, uh, uh, incredibly difficult enterprise to figure out what the molecule, what exactly the molecule is doing. And it really turned out to be a chemistry story. It turns out the molecule was shown was not the active compound, but um, when you let it stand for some time in solution, it would dimerize, it would form a chemical reaction and form this other molecule that really doesn't look that much like that what the molecule that's shown. And the, these scientists at Bristol, this team of chemists and biologists figured it out. Uh, and what gave them the um, courage to do that is, I don't know, because the, they really had to take a big step back to figure it out. Um, and they got, and, um, and they did though, and they found out what the active molecule was. And then there's another, you know, year, a year or so goes by to optimize the molecule and figure out its toxicology and would it work in animals um, before they took it um, in, into humans, before they figured, wow, this is a molecule that really could work and, and took it. So the phase one trials, so this whole project started in, you know, probably early 2003. Uh, they, uh, they took it into human trials in two, late 2007, early 2008, and it was approved in 2015. So a 12 year, project um, to get this, you know, wonderful drug. Um, okay, so um, we didn't have that time. We, st we still don't have that time in, in um, treating COVID-19. If we're going to get a molecule that's going to have impact on human health in, you know, in the near term, in the next year, it really has to be um, repurposing a molecule, a drug that already exists or something that's near to a drug. Um, and this, and, and so that's sort of a crazy enterprise. And, and the reason it's crazy is that most drugs, you know, they're optimized to do one particular thing. And, um, and, and we're saying, well, we're going to find this use against antiviral activity that, that really wasn't anticipated for the drugs. And, uh, and how do we even expect to do that? And, and the, the thing, it, it's, not that like, it's not that likely that any given drug you're going to try and repurpose will work um, for COVID-19. But the thing that we can draw on is that most drugs have activity on multiple targets. They have the, the activity that, they're, that they were developed for, but then they have these off-target effects. And I've already shown you that with the um, cold medications, right? the nighttime cold medications hit the histamine receptor, but then they also hit the sigma receptor and they do other things. And so this was um, work that our lab has been really interested in over the years. This is a paper that my friend and colleague, Mike Kaiser published when he was still a, a graduate student at UCSF. 
And what it illustrated is this, this network among drugs that, you know, they're developed for one particular um, t target, but they'll often hit multiple ones. And you can systematically draw that out. And so what we, what we, we drew upon this idea in, in this project with uh, Kayvon and, and Nevin. Um, and so we started f looking for FDA approved drugs. There's not that many. Actually, a lot of people are, sh I was at least shocked to learn that there's only 2,000 or so, maybe even slightly fewer FDA approved drugs. And not that many drugs that have been, you know, in people and, you know, even got to the clinical stage. You know, there's maybe 10,000 of those. There's many more preclinical drug candidates. We were interested in those molecules that are getting close to drug discovery uh, too, but the, the numbers are small. So we're really relying on this polypharmacology of, of drugs um, against human targets. That was our one big advantage here. Uh, these are all human drugs. We, and we were going at the, what Nevin's work taught us is that we could attack the human vi targets that were subverted by the virus. Thank you, Brian. Um, so now one other uh, way we try to pick drugs, uh, as Brian described the chemi-informatics uh, approach and looking at known targets and off targets uh, and combining that with Nevin's systems biology host map that he described so nicely, we then wanted to incorporate any expert knowledge we could find at UCSF or anywhere in the world uh, and so when the host factors were identified from the proteomics that Nevin described, if they hit on a piece of biology that somebody at UCSF has uh, worked on before, then we went to them and asked them, well, which molecules would you suggest that we use that are really uh, sort of well characterized that we could add to our map so that we could flesh out and cover the whole map. So now here's the map with drugs that are targeting the host factors. And you see the chemical structures uh, of each of them. They're very diverse. Some are natural products, some are synthetic, like the ones that Brian described in the HCV drug discovery approach. We really went for the diversity to cover the map as much as possible. And as we were doing this, amazingly, of course, we were trying to find approved drugs or drugs that were in clinical trials. Those are yellow, purple are preclinical molecules. But in the process of when, while we were doing this, this drug remdesivir that targets the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase in the left, it was a drug in clinical trials. And then today it's been received uh, exceptional uh, approval by the, the FDA. So among all of these agents, things were getting approved and investigated in real time. So the next slide gives you an idea in one little portion of the map. So as Nevin said, the red diamonds are the viral proteins, the dots are the host factors, the human proteins. What we're looking for are the host enablers of the virus. These interactions are suggesting this viral protein's job, we think is to bind to one of these dots and either co-opt it for its own function, or maybe the dot is the host protein that is trying to uh, prevent the viral protein from functioning. And we're going to test those directionalities with these drugs. So we have some that target, you see the centrosome is a large complex, and we have a drug in the lower left, WDB002, that binds to one small protein in that large complex called CEP250, and on and on and on. So this gives you an idea of how the map is constructed and how the logic is laid out. On the next slide, um, is a list of all the drugs. And again, green are the approved drugs. It would be wonderful if we could find an approved drug that shows antiviral activity and we'll show some of those. But then we also had drugs that were in clinical trials. We identified several of those. Uh, and then preclinical molecules are something, it would probably take us at minimum two years to get into the clinic. But the green and the yellow we could get into a clinical trial in a matter of, of months if, if we were very confident in, in the activity. So um, this is the paper that uh, Nevin mentioned we published on the, the BioArchive uh, preprint server. This is something new to science uh, that has been really, really revolutionary. It allowed us to disseminate our results prior to peer review 
uh, and it uh, really catalyzed, as Nevin showed you, uh, people around the world realizing that we had all these clones, and he described how we sent it around to over 38 countries, uh, and it really further disseminated the tools for the research community. And one thing we highlighted in the paper was that we're not filing for any patent protection on these interactions. And we are uh, basically trying to, as quickly as po possible, accelerate the dissemination of the information for other people as well to use. Next slide. I think now Nevin will tell us about how the collaborators were involved. So thanks, Kayvon. So at, at this point, we've talked to you about um, how we've generated the map and how Kayvon and Brian and their collaborators identified drugs and compounds uh, based on the map that we would think have uh, anti-COVID-19 activity, now we needed to test them in a laboratory setting. And the time we made these predictions, very few laboratories in the world um, actually had the virus growing. Actually, they, not many places have the virus growing right now. We didn't have the capability to test our drug and compound predictions here in San Francisco at the time. There's been some heroic effort done by Melanie at the Gladstone Institute. She has the virus working right now. We're starting to work with her. But at the time, uh, maybe six weeks ago, uh, we, uh, she did not have that capability. So we reached out to some of our collaborators, connections that we had made in the past um, via the Quantitative Biosciences Institute. And Jacqueline will speak a little bit about this at the uh, end of our seminar and how important establishing these relationships and collaborations in terms of moving science forward. Uh, so we worked with uh, two of the best uh, virological places in the world, the Pasteur Institute in Paris, working closely with Marco Vignuzzi and um, Olivia Schwartz. And then at Mount Sinai Hospital uh, in New York, uh, specifically the Department of Microbiology, uh, we've uh, collaborated with a good friend of mine, Adolfo Garci Garcia Sastra, and then uh, Chris White, an assistant professor that works closely um, uh, with Adolfo. So we had the great um, advantage of being able to collaborate with these fantastic scientists to test our predictions, not just in two labs, but in two continents. And we we're very satisfied that we got similar results in both places. So they carried out the following experiments for us. Very similar experimentation pipeline, but, but different, uh, slightly different. And it was an advantage to us that we had uh, these two different assays that we could uh, compare. Uh, so we were using uh, Vero 6 cells here on the left. Uh, these are African green monkey cells. Uh, these are uh, cells that are uh, particularly compatible with this type of drug screening. And they're, they're very compatible with being infected by SARS-CoV-2. There's work ongoing right now to determine which human cells are, will be most compatible uh, for infection. Uh, that work is still ongoing, but uh, initially we're just gonna be looking at monkey cells and we grow them up there on the left uh, for 22 hours. Uh, and then we add a drug um, for two hours and then we in, uh, carry out an infection uh, at zero hours here on the pipeline. Uh, and uh, New York and Paris added slightly different amounts of virus. So MOI stands for multiplicity of infection. That relates to how much virus that you put in to uh, the cells. And in Paris, it was four times higher than, than New York. Uh, but in both places, you waited 48 hours. You stopped the experiment with formaldehyde. And then there were readouts. So the virus is essentially comprised of two components, protein and RNA. And that's, that's it. Um, and in New York, they used one of the proteins as a readout, an antibody against one of the viral proteins called NP and a high resolution microscopy setup. Uh, and then they carried out viral titer assays. It's called TCID 50 to see how infectious the viral particles were as they took them off the cells to see what effects the drugs and compounds had on them. And in Paris, instead of looking at the protein, they looked at the RNA component of the virus and they analyzed that uh, using RT-PCR and they also carried out a, a, a plaque assay. This is looking again at how infectious the viral particles are that you isolate from the cells after you treat them with the drug. So there's two different assays, um, similar assays, and it was so important for us to, in my opinion, to be carrying out two different but complementary assays in these two different places, which gave us uh, even more confidence on the results that we got because uh, they were uh, similar in both of these places. So then we... Uh... As, you, as uh, Nevin described, we uh, collected the molecules here in San Francisco and shipped them to both Paris and New York. And they ran these assays during the time when a pandemic is still ongoing in New York and Paris. That led us to a, be able to analyze, um, as you see here, 
47 drugs were tested at various doses, and we tested them the presence of the virus and the absence. And now we'll tell you some of that data uh, and some of the most interesting drug candidates on the next slide. So 10 uh, agents out of the 47 showed activity, but they fall into two categories. One category is the production of proteins. These are inhibitors of mRNA translation or the production uh, of, of how the cell makes protein. Remember, this is a RNA virus. So as soon as it enters the cell, it needs to convert its RNA into protein and it uses the host cell translation machinery. These drugs will tell you uh, target that machinery. The next group uh, was a really exciting group that Brian will tell you more about. And, and these are targeting the sigma R1, R2 receptors that he already introduced. And they consist of antihistamines, antipsychotics, antimalarials, hormones, anti-anxiety drugs, and preclinical molecules. And these are uh, one of the biggest discoveries I think the group has made. And he'll tell you about melperone specifically. The next slide. I um, just want to give you back into a zoom into the node and um, how these um, curves look. So if we look in the upper left, we have remdesivir. This is a direct acting viral from Gilead that was, we said, just approved today. In black is the uh, curve for the uh, decrease in the viral titer. Uh, as we give the drug at higher and higher doses, lower doses on the left, higher doses on the right. In red, the red curve is this ability of the cells to survive the treatment with the drug without virus around. So the cytotoxicity and then the antiviral effect. So that direct acting drug looks like it has a good window of therapeutic index. It can block the titer of the virus, but not kill the cells. We'll, um, sort of move on, I, I think, to um, Brian, I believe. Yeah, so this is going back to the map that we started. And it's a, what it is for us is it's a roadmap of subverted, likely subverted human proteins that are potential drug targets for us. And Kayvon just took you through one of the most exciting ones, the uh, mRNA translation inhibitors that's you know part of the genetic code dna to rna to protein that's what the genetic code is basically and uh and and there was a second family so we they were as kevon alluded to there were a bunch of we, we tried a bunch of human targets that haven't played out yet but there was a second big family that did and i'm going to take you through that and th so these are um two Two different receptors called sigma one and sigma two. They sound like, given their names, you think they'd be very similar. They have similar um, uh, locations in the cell. They're integral membrane. They live in the lipid membranes internal to the cell, um, but they're not similar in terms of their structure and sequence, despite their names. What they are similar in is uh, two things. One is they bind similar molecules, as you'll see, and they come out of this wonderful roadmap. Um, the, the viral NSP6 protein associates with sigma-1 receptor. The ORF9C viral protein, these are both viral proteins in the, uh, in the red uh, diamonds, interacts with the sigma-2 receptor. Uh, so, okay, so here's their, this gives something about their um, mechanism. The uh, sigma-1, it, it, is involved in um, stress responses in mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum. So these are two membrane-bound organelles and the, the receptor lives in, in the membrane. And the sigma-2 is, is thought to be involved in vesicle trafficking and other things. And what was exciting, uh, I think, for many of us is we, we've had a sort of a long familiarity with these sigma receptors. They're sort of dark horses but dark horses of, of sort of long renown in pharmacology, people have struggled to understand exactly what they do uh, in pharmacology and biology. But what we knew was that there were a lot of molecules that modulated them, often as off targets, often as secondary targets. In fact, I showed you that earlier on when we we're talking about the cold medications. Dextromatorphan is an agonist for sigma-1, but the other molecules are... Uh, are all they hit they do hit sigma one but they're it, it's not their primary target 
Um, so uh, when we saw that sigma one and sigma two were involved, we, we, there was a ready supply of molecules that we could test them on. And, and uh, uh, the one on the bottom is hydroxychloroquine, uh, which has been much in the news. Uh, it, it is antiviral in, the, in um, the hands of our collaborators in, in Adolfo's lab and in Marco's lab at, in Paris. Um, uh, and it's about, at least in this essay, it's about as potent as PB28. PB28 was developed for the sigma receptor. Hydrox, for hydroxychloroquine, the sigma receptor is a, is a polypharmacology, a secondary target, and a side effect target perhaps. And it's something that we knew about and, and, and we're, so this is an example of us exploiting side effects for something good, perhaps. To some extent, when you're going after sigma receptors, um, you're a little bit of a, a kid in a candy store because there's so many molecules that are active. And you, we've, I think we've highlighted some of these results before. And, and what you can see, so there's what, one, two, three, four, five, six, six categories of molecules here in terms of their uh, fundamental physiology, uh, antihistamines, antipsychotics, antimalarials, uh, hormones, progesterone is a, is a female sex hormone, anti-anxiety uh, drugs. Um, so what unites them is that they all hit the sigma receptor. Their primary targets are different, uh, but what unites them is that they all hit the sigma receptor. And, and this is just showing again their activity in the viral assays uh, these these are the uh, these are the data from um, uh, Adolfo Garcia Sastre's lab at at, uh, at Mount Sinai. With so many different targets involved, you can say, well, how sure are you that they hit the sigma receptors uh, as their key targets for the antiviral effect? And to be candid, we're still not completely sure, and we won't know for several weeks until we do um, we combine the drug actions with with genetic experiments, but. What you can see on the right is, is a Venn diagram that Kayvon suggested, actually, uh, for how these drugs, what targets they share in common. And the only targets that they all share in common, as far as we know, um, are, are the sigma receptors. There, there are some other plausible candidates, and we're going to look through them. But for right now, our, going, our working hypothesis, and it's been a very productive, it's led us to new molecules, uh, is that they're acting through the sigma 1 and sigma 2 receptors. The thing I do want to say, going back to chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, is that for these sorts of molecules, these these are molecules that bear a positive charge and are and they're like many drugs, are pretty greasy molecules. Those types of molecules hit this receptor on the heart called the Herg receptor. It's the number one um, toxicity target in drug discovery. It's it's the one target that the FDA mandates that you look at long before you bring things into humans. And it's, um, it, it causes heart, molecules that inhibit this ion channel um, cause arrhythmias. And, and uh, astemazole, remember astemazole? It was a molecule that killed people. It's because it hit the Herg channel. And, um, and so does chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Um, hits the Herg channel fairly hard. And um, that's like, because you have to dose those molecules high for their antiviral activity, the uh, effects on Herg channels are probably responsible for the cardiac toxicities that have in fact emerged in, in the careful, controlled clinical trials of those molecules and um, are, are why the, the, the doses that they can use using those molecules are limited and, and why many of those trials have stopped actually be, because there's this um, uh, some, some have asked, well, what do you have to lose by taking these molecules? And it turns out what you might have to lose is your life because you can get a heart attack and die. So that's always a danger for uh, the, that side effect and other side effects are something you always have to be aware of when you're developing a drug. It's a, it's a thin needle that we're, we're, we're trying to thread. So some additional observations here, as you know, Brian and Kevon told you about, the molecules that target the, the sigma receptors um, perturb the virus through a very different mechanisms than what we're seeing with the mRNA um, translation inhibitors, um, potentially through uh, the cell stress response, so that's the sigma receptors. Uh, and therefore, um, what we're really excited about is trying a combinatorial approach to uh, uh, coming up with a cocktail of antivirals that we could use. And that could be uh, a combination of these two sets of drugs that Kayvon and Brian told you about, or it could be 
one or both of these with a compound that binds to the virus and inhibits it, like remdesivir. Uh, and if you remember to HIV treatments, it was the cocktail that was uh, the big breakthrough where you have three different drugs um, that you're used in combination. I, I think, and I think the team thinks that uh, this has a really good chance, this combinatorial approach um, in terms of being successful in the future, hopefully using one of our drugs against the host or somebody else's drugs combined with an antiviral like remdesivir. So uh, we'll see if that is successful in the future. Uh, so Brian talked about antagonists for the receptors, specifically the sigma receptors, where you can turn down the activity of the receptor. Well, there's agonists, as he also talked about, where you can turn up the activity of the receptor. And uh, Brian talked a lot about dextromethorphan and um, consistent with this uh, particular drug turning up the receptor, um, interestingly, we see an increase of viral infection. It seems to be proviral. Uh, and actually, from a, a scientific point of view, this was exciting because it uh, confirmed our hypothesis that these uh, receptors are uh, really being targeted by uh, the virus and, and being targeted by uh, these uh, drugs uh, and are having um, an effect on the virus that we thought they would have. This is what we hypothesize. So this gives us confidence that these receptors are important. But of course, it has other implications. As Brian uh, showed you, dextromethorphan is actually in the majority of over-the-counter cough syrups. And of course, those that have COVID-19, 90% of them have um, a dry cough as a symptom, and they'd be reaching for this obviously, to alleviate those uh, symptoms. So it's kind of an uh, ironic connection. Um, now, we're not saying that um, individuals that are infected should not take cough syrups, but we're just trying to responsibly report uh, to uh, the community that we see these results in the laboratory. There's a big question is if we actually see it being proviral uh, for individuals taking the cough syrup. There's a, that's a big jump. It's a big question. Does this get up to a high enough concentration in the blood to actually have proviral activity in the body? We don't know, but uh, we just wanted to uh, caution the public that these are the results that we see in the laboratory, and more uh, studies are required to see if they have proviral activity uh, in humans. Just like we're looking at these antiviral effects in the laboratory, the big question is, are they going to have antiviral effects in humans? And a lot more work is required to be able to say that. So what's next here? Uh, we're sharing our data with drug makers, authorities, um, and uh, public health officials. Um, several companies, as uh, Kayvon alluded to, are looking very closely at taking these agents into clinical trials to evaluate their antiviral effectiveness and therapeutic um, index. We're obviously continuing our research on, on COVID-19 in a number of different ways. We've actually screened two-thirds of these drugs. We're excited to continue to work with Paris and York to screen the other one-third and other drugs and compounds that we think could have antiviral effects as well. Um, I think one, um, we talked about going after the host in terms of a, a therapeutic strategy. Um, and I'd mentioned before that um, that could potentially overcome um, resistance that you'd see when you target the virus. Another plus here would be that um, we've seen in the past that multiple viruses hit the same host machinery. And if we come up with one treatment for COVID-19, it could be applicable for COVID-22, COVID-24, and actually other viruses uh, as well. Um, following COVID-19 response, uh, research is gonna resume in a number of different uh, disease areas. Most of us obviously uh, have not worked on um, a lot of these viruses in the past. We work on cancer, neurodegenerative disease, other disease areas. But I, one thing, point I want to make is I think we've learned a lot in terms of how to do science, um, in terms of um, breaking down uh, different barriers that exist uh, between um, different institutions, different laboratories, between pharmaceutical companies and um, academia. And when push comes to shove, we could actually see how fast we could move when we all really work together. The problem with science is that it's very siloed, and it's siloed in a number of different ways, different laboratories across different institutions, between pharmaceutical companies and, and academia. And for me, a great silver lining out of all this work is um, to see how fast we could actually move when we all work together. Uh, and if you think about it, this is a virus we didn't even really know about much about at Christmas. In the last you know, three and a half months, we identified the virus, we generated this map, we made predictions, um, drug predictions um, based on the map. We've set up virological assays with our collaborators. We've tested these drugs and compounds. And now we're in a position to take some of these compounds and drugs 
um, into people. And for me, that's just a, a, an amazing, remarkable speed. Um, and that happened because we could break down these silos. And what I'd want to see here after the dust settles on COVID-19 is this type of attitude to study um, other uh, diseases, other viruses. And the goal here is, in my opinion, is to, to maintain this infrastructure that we've set up to uh, study uh, COVID-19 and apply it to COVID-22, COVID-24, and other disease areas going forward. And obviously to do this, we've had to set up this great collaborative network in a short period of time. And Jacqueline's gonna speak a little bit more about the connections that we've made over the last several years. We're in a perfect position, I would argue, to be able to react um, uh, to this pandemic through all of these fantastic collaborations that we've set up with these uh, great collaborators. Um, and here's about an acknowledgement slide, acknowledging all the authors. There's um, Todd again, the hero here of the story, sending out all these drugs and compounds and plasmids to laboratories all over the world. And you can see here that the authors acknowledge their partners and families for support um, uh, during this uh, time. Uh, many of the scientists have uh, obviously families and the support from their families was absolutely crucial in order to carry out um, this uh, uh, collaborative work in such a short period of time. All right, so we thought we would also give you a bit of background on QBI to explain why we were so well situated to allow for the formation of a group like the QCRG so quickly. QBI has 103 labs affiliated to it, focused on basic science, disease agnostic research, as well as experimental and computational research. We are, we are well known for our cell mapping initiatives. We are also known for investing in young scientists and the empowerment of women. However, we are mostly known for our multiple and varied events that we've had over the years, which are both local and international. And this has helped us establish a culture of collaboration. Um, so over the years, Nevin has mentioned his cell mapping initiatives earlier, and he alluded to the host pathogen map initiative earlier as he showed you his cell maps. But we started thinking, well, what if? What if in the same way we map cells, we started mapping the world with collaborative interactions? What if cell mapping equaled world mapping and protein-protein interactions equaled people-people interactions? And as such, we looked at these network maps and started looking at them from a human perspective. We looked at the world and we looked at the activity around the world and the scientists that we were interacting with, looking at these people interaction networks. And as such, we started looking at these connections that we had made and looking at the similarities. And we found that, in fact, we could cluster people around specific interests, infectious diseases, technology, cancer, and so on. Importantly, you'll notice that in our infectious disease network, we had already identified New York and Paris, which of course came to play a huge role in the QCRG right now. Our collaboration started at home. Among these center grants, we had about five of them that amount to about $85 million in research that have gone to over 50 uh, PIs and their labs. The center grants are comprised of at least 10 PIs each. And so we have this great culture of collaboration that already exists among the UCSF scientists and beyond. It was not a huge step to then take the collaboration into the international realm. We established international relationships based on the science, so from the ground up. And we fostered these with collaborative symposia, and later formalized with MOUs and RFAs for collaborative research. As of today, QBI has quite a few formalized relationships with Germany, Ireland, France, Nigeria, Poland, Israel, the UK, and of course, I'd like to bring your attention back to the one with the Institut Pasteur in France. The formation of the QCRG was really an understanding of the context of the coming pandemic and the ability to take action quickly. The beginnings are very, very human. Late one Friday night in early March, scientists gathered in a room to discuss how they were going to move their labs to focus entirely on COVID-19 research. And to do this, we were going to generate a map. In doing so, there was an absolutely mad rush in prepping mass spec samples and getting the samples done to be able to create this map, which has become the key element of the research that has developed. The team later formed to the 22 scientists that are now leading the group. And there were some important meetings that took place as discussions evolved as to the immediate action and who would be doing what. What we didn't know at that point during that meeting is that it would be the last meeting in person for everyone and the last time that many of us would be touching other people on a regular basis. Because quite suddenly, everyone was working from home. 
COVID-19 quarantine 2020, as we're all experiencing it. Suddenly, extensive teamwork was taking over on Zoom. Of course, we've all, we all know that the science communication lends itself very well to Zoom. People are quite used to presentation and Q&A formats. However, the following for QCRG was huge as of day two, and 178 scientists on one call became a little bit unsustainable time-wise. As a result, multiple uh, subgroups formed. We tried to see what tools we could provide to the team to facilitate communication and the sharing of information, files, and all the rest. What we quickly realized is that most of these tools already exist. We just had to fine tune them. Things like Google Calendar, Zoom, and most importantly, Slack existed for communication exchange of findings in absolutely real time. You could connect calendars, upload files, and have a magnificent exchange, which of course led to the map at an unprecedented speed. The map, as you know, is then overlaid with the drug and compound information, which would lead to sending the drugs to New York and Paris. Of course, sending the drugs to New York was not such a challenge. However, we also came across these um, transportation blockades that came or, or uh, stops that came as a result of countries closing borders. An interesting human aspect of the story is that QBI already had an ex excellent relationship with the San Francisco French consulate, and we have been planning We've been planning all sorts of activities with them. However, the relationship quickly turned to what can we do to help, as they said. And there was a bit of a block with getting some of the compounds to France as they could get stuck in customs. A quick call to the French consulate led the consul to call the French ambassador, who in turn called the head of FedEx and the French customs to allow for the drugs and compounds to arrive at excellent speed at the Institut Pasteur for, for their assays. Um, so as we, as we moved on, we, had, we obviously knew we had a very interesting story developing, and we developed our narrative and decided to engage people at all levels, not only our own community and scientists who were involved, but sharing the information as it happened very quickly with the lay audience as well. We had a sudden media explosion, which led us to realize that we also needed help. And in, as such, we pulled, to get, we pulled in a PR agency that's helped us manage our messaging, as well as everything else around managing an influx of media that's not usually seen in science. What we importantly realized is that we also had to write our own story to a certain measure, because the media does not always relay the story as you intended it to come out. The stuff is rather complicated for the lay audience or even the average journalist. And so we have taken time to write stories in our own voice to express what is important, what our vision is, and what the emphasis we would like to see happen with the discoveries. What we saw happening as a result of all this information we were sharing is an army of willingness, as we like to call it. We found all kinds of influential people backing us very openly and offering us certain connections. As Nevin mentioned earlier, Zoic Labs, you know, an, an, a group of 20 people worked tirelessly with our scientists to create this very interactive map, which is generating a lot of interest in the scientific community and beyond. Other companies also pulled in to help us get plasmids going uh, across the world, as well as more, as you'll see in the coming slide. So one thing we realized, which was very important, is that we had to also be open to the resulting innovation. The same way QBI fostered an atmosphere for the QCRG to form, it turns out that the QCRG fostered an atmosphere for other groups to form. Out of this, the Structural Biology Consortium was recently put together, and we offered them a quick platform and were able to accept um, accept the help that Benchling, a company with uh, lab notebooks, was able to offer us for free. So what we're seeing is an incredible response from the lay audience, companies, scientists, and everything around the world. So it's quite incredible to see people pulling together to come to this solution. And with that, I'd like to stay, stay tuned because things are changing all the time. Find out more at qbi.ucsf.edu. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Nevin, Kayvon, Jacqueline, Brian. Um, and let's get you all back on. And uh, we are open for questions. I think um, I can ask Nevin the first one, uh, which is uh, with from Sean uh, Kirkland. With HIV, we found that combination antiretroviral therapy suppressed the virus. Would that work with COVID? 
So it's, it's a, a great question. Um, so the big breakthrough, obviously, with HIV was to have a cocktail of uh, drugs. Um, and most of the cocktails contain three drugs uh, targeting three different viral proteins. Uh, it's usually the protease, the reverse transcriptase, and the uh, integrase. Um, and um, here, with this virus, um, we don't have those same proteins. Uh, there is a protease, um, but it's very different, and the coronavirus doesn't have these two other enzymes that uh, is contained in this ARD cocktail. Um, so the, this strategy that we use to treat HIV would not work against COVID-19. However, the strategy of coming up with a cocktail, as we had talked about in the presentation, I think is a very good one. Uh, and uh, we, we're finding some promising drugs that target host factors. Maybe a combination of these drugs in the future would be powerful, or maybe combining one of these drugs that target the host protein with remdesivir, which is actually now approved by the FDA, maybe that will be the big breakthrough. Uh, but uh, we won't be using the drugs that were used to fighting HIV, but I think a similar strategy that's behind the cocktail that was used to treat HIV could come to fruition here and be successful treating COVID-19. Well, this is a, a question from Jeff, actually, about um, why we're not hearing more in the news about avoiding dextromorphan. Uh, maybe both of you, Jeff and Nevin, can speak to that. Maybe, uh, actually, Jeff and Brian maybe can uh, each take a crack at that. Uh, well, uh, it, uh, so this is Brian. Um, I don't know why we're not hearing more about it. Um, I think before that's established, we'd, we'd want to, you know, look at that clinically and in trials and, and carefully. Uh, I don't know that we're necessarily telling everybody to stop taking cough syrup or cough medications where it's hard to take find a cough medication that doesn't have dextromethorphan in it. Uh, um, but, you know, I think it is a cause for concern. So you had said that one of the medications that seem to have uh, efficacy is a, I, I believe is a molecule in cough medications in Japan. So it seems like one of them actually can suppress viral activity and one of them seems to accelerate viral activity and wouldn't, I mean, granted, we, we do many things in medicine that don't have proof but have biologic plausibility. Uh, wouldn't it sort of make sense to just, you know, spread that wisdom around until we get the data? That, that, I guess that's what I'm asking. We have spread that wisdom around. Um, <laughs> uh, we, but we're really cautious about people overreacting too. I mean, there's a lot of that that's happened already. Yeah, we, we reported this information, um, but we tried to do as responsibly as uh, possible. And as Brian's saying, with very strong caveats, we're seeing these trends in a laboratory setting in cells uh, and it is a big jump uh, to see if we see the same phenomenon in humans. However, nevertheless, I think it is our responsibility to report this information as responsibly as possible to, to the general public. And that's what we've tried to do. So I think one of the questions was about, uh, again, about the HERG channels. How many of the drugs really hit the HERG channel, Brian, and of the 10 that we, we spoke about? Uh, and, and maybe uh, speak again about the window uh, of efficacy versus hitting the herd. Yeah, I mean, for the protein translation, sorry, the mRNA translation inhibitors, the protein biogenesis inhibitors uh, that Kayvon talked about, those probably, HERG is probably not much of a consideration. They're probably pretty clean there. For the sigma receptors, on the other hand, for those drugs like clemestine and cloperastine, and haloperidol, and, and even some of the newer ones like ceramacine and melperone, those ones hitting the HERG receptor is an issue. Um, many of them uh, don't hit it as hard as uh, hydroxychloroquine does, but some of them do. Like um, actually, clemestine is actually hits HERG uh, stronger than uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine. So it, it is, even for those molecules, it's a concern. And the goal is to find the right window molecules that are active on the virus and have a big enough window uh, between their activity on the virus and where they're gonna hit HERG. 
So that that's always the key. Thank you, Nevin. Uh, we spoke about you spoke about uh, traditional barriers being overcome in this amazing collective effort. At this point, what barriers do you uh, see that remain to be the most perplexing and the most uh, vexing for future efforts? I think that's a really nice question to think. Although we've made a lot of progress, what, what do you think is still a hurdle? I think that's a great question. Um, and uh, I obviously touched upon it in, in the seminar talking about us, our attempts trying to break down silos. And I mean, for me, um, it's really how to uh, make this type of effort sustainable. And the problem, in my opinion, in science is it's too siloed, as I said. In the academic world, um, the way the, the infrastructure is set up, it's, you're often discouraged from collaborating, in my opinion. You know, it's an individual that gets the Nobel Prize. It's one person that gets a grant. It's one person that gets tenured. And oftentimes that type of attitude discourages especially young scientists from coming and bringing their enthusiasm and bringing their new ideas to the table and they become uh, very guarded. So uh, that's always been perplexing to me. Uh, but as we've seen here in our group and many other groups around the world, how fast we can move when we break down those barriers and all work together. So the question for me is, um, you know, how do we make this more sustainable? How do we change the infrastructure so that we can do this again and again for the next pandemic? Or you know, the question is, why aren't we studying all diseases in this uh, urgent and, and very collaborative uh, way? And I'm hoping that you know, based out of this tragedy, there is a silver lining and we can change the system and, and be more um, um, proactive instead of reactive when the next pandemic comes around. Thank you. Jacqueline, do you have anything to add? I think you've been such a pioneer in getting this collaboration off the ground and sustaining it and launching it even before we were in the pandemic. What, what did you see that still needs to be done? I think an ability to, to, commute very effect, to communicate very effectively um, among nations and to make sure that governments are supporting this, these kinds of collaborations as well, right? So, uh, you know, we meet with other uh, potential collaborators or eventual uh, collaborators, but it's hard to get two or more governments at the table at the same time to provide for the funding that really should come from there for these groups. So that's, I think, something that would be fantastic to see and possibly could come out of this pandemic as a result. Yes, more money into research. That's the message, especially collaborative research. Okay, great. This one, uh, I'll try to answer. This one is, if there are only 2,000 FDA-approved uh, drugs, why not test all for antiviral effectiveness? Another great question. In fact, another group uh, in San Diego did just that. So there's a lot of effort going on to just collect all the drugs that have approved or have been in people and test them in vi antiviral assays. And the that can find a, a, a really great winner sometimes. But I think what's different about this approach is because we had a hypothesis about each drug and how it might work, we could really look at the data and very carefully analyze, just like you saw on the antagonist or the antagonist of one receptor. And we could see that actually, even though one was slightly proviral, it really told us something about another molecule in the set that we had tested. When you just test all of them randomly, it's very hard to take those kinds of uh, threads and bring them together into a hypothesis. And as Brian said, the pipeline of uh, drug discovery is so long, the more mechanistic understanding you have at the beginning of that pipeline, the more likely you're gonna make it to the end with a successful drug. So it's great to do uh, random screening, but I, I think this approach gives us a much deeper mechanistic understanding. Um, let's see, uh, another question is, if we're successful and we're able to block the interaction between the virus and the host with drugs, would a vaccine creating antibodies be no longer necessary? Uh, Nevin. I think we need to be pushing on all fronts here. I think different, uh, it's been shown in the past, different sets of the population will respond to uh, different treatment regimens, uh, oftentimes with other uh, vaccines. Um, uh, so older generation don't respond as effectively to, to vaccines. That's been shown with some of the influenza uh, vaccines that have been generated um, in the past. Um, and Therefore, I think the more options we have at the table, the more powerful we are. And 
at this point, we don't even know if we're going to have a vaccine. And, um, and we don't even know if we're going to have a drug regimen that's going to work. So as scientists, we need to be pushing as hard as we can on all fronts. And maybe at the end, it will be a combination of drugs within a therapeutic regimen, as well as, as a suite of treatments in general that we could be using. I hope we do have those options in the future. Great. This one is for you, Brian. Uh, Hannah uh, roughly understands how interrupting the mRNA translation inhibits the virus, but uh, she'd like to know a little more simply about how the drugs that target the sigma, re sigma receptors hurt viral replication. Yeah, great question. And I got to say, I don't think we completely understand it either. I was going to say, that's a question I wanted to know the answer to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm buying the same question, so he doesn't answer it. <laughs> yeah, uh, what I can tell you is we really want to understand it, and we're, we're trying to understand it, and there's a lot of experiments coming up. But, but roughly, what we think is going on is the sigma receptor is a stress response protein. When the cells get stressed, it, it gets activated and acts as what's called a chaperone for other proteins that, that keeps them stable under these stressful conditions. But, so the cell processes can keep going. And the virus, which puts the cell under a huge amount of stress, it's gonna kill the cell eventually. Uh, what we think is it, it subverts the normal use of the sigma receptor to stabilize processes that it needs to go forward. And so keeping the cell alive, keeping the biogenesis of new lipids going, um, keeping proteins that it needs to be stable, stable. So that's our working hypothesis, but stay tuned. Hannah has a follow-up question. She uh, has a sharp eye and noticed that one of the most uh, uh, active antiviral drugs that also hits the uh, sigma receptors, PB28, also uh, hits HERG, but much less so than the other drugs. So that's very attractive, but she wants to know, uh, is it likely that it'll be looked into more, or is its preclinical status a pretty big block? Um, I think yes. <laughs> it's a pretty big block, but it is an attractive molecule. Um, so those considerations of like, well, where we get the biggest separation between efficacy and toxicity, huge consideration. How high we can get the molecule in humans, how, what concentration we can safely get it to is the higher we can get it to safely, the better. That's a huge concentration consideration. Some of these drugs like cloperastine and clemestine look really interesting, but we can't get them to very high concentrations. Um, so these are all, so it's a multi-variable analysis and um, we're trying to work our way through it. Could I add something to that, Kayvon? I, so PB28 obviously is a preclinical molecule, but Brian and his team, they have these incredibly powerful chemoformatic tools, and they're now every day predicting new drugs and compounds that are in that same class. And as Kevin was saying, if you know the target, if you know the biology, you can be so much more predictive with the chemistry and the pharmacology. So almost on a daily basis, we're getting new virological data based on uh, um, Brian's predictions in this category. And um, we're very excited about some recent results. And I think, I hope, Brian, that we'll find an FDA-approved drug in that category, that is just as potent as PB28 in the near future. Maybe this is a good moment, Nevin, for you to explain. Uh, in the past, we talked about other maps you've made and how you uh, sort of prosecuted that information and what you did with it using genetics. Uh, explain how in this situation, we really didn't have access to that genetic tests of the map and uh, what you did in its place. And PB28, I think, is uh, what you just explained about that being preclinical, though it's a very powerful uh, sort of piece of information. So maybe give a minute to that, I think. Sure, um, I think Jacqueline had shown a slide of our previous work where we had generated uh, similar maps on other viruses over the last 10 years. Our initial map was on HIV. We extended this approach to dengue and Zika and Ebola and hepatitis C and, and influenza. And um, we identify putative human proteins through these maps that we think are involved in these different viral infections. And now what we've been doing normally, and it's taken, a, it takes a while, is to perturb these genes one at a time using genetic approaches. Initially RNAi, and now we're using CRISPR, because CRISPR is revolutionizing genetic analysis, obviously. So we delete these genes and now primary cells and see what effects they have on infection. And then 
the next step was going to be, all right, we're going to find a, a human gene that we could genetically connect to the virus whose protein physically interacts with one of the viral proteins. Then we can reach out to scientists like Kayvon and Brian to say, all right, let's find a pharmacological tool that would mimic the genetic perturbation that could then be used um, uh, therapeutically. But in this case, we didn't have a genetic system and, and speed was of the essence. So I went right to these, these characters, uh, Kayvon and Brian, and I said, all right, we've got these proteins. Well, let's go right to the pharmacology. Let's make these predictions um, about uh, compounds or drugs that would bind and, and, and inhibit these uh, human proteins. And this would do two things. One, it would validate the protein-protein interaction map. And then two, it could often point, as you've seen today, point in a certain therapeutic uh, a direction. So now using this strategy, we're going to go back to all our maps, all our host pathogen protein protein interaction maps and do the same thing. We also have maps on cancer and Parkinson's disease and heart disease. Uh, so um, I don't know if Kevin and Brian like this, but I'm going to be working with those guys a long time, um, focusing on all these other maps uh, focused on uh, different disease areas. So in my, in my way, the way I'm looking at it, it's almost like a new way to do drug discovery, at least a quicker way to do drug discovery. And I'm very excited to be applying that approach to other diseases in the near future. Thanks, Devin. I think following up on that uh, idea of just this, um, you know, push towards more collaboration, Gary Winter is asking uh, how and who uh, is coordinating all of the collaborative activity. That's for Jacqueline. That's Jacqueline and, and you both. I want each of you to answer. Uh, and and how's, yeah, how's it being coordinated? Why don't you start, Jacqueline? Thanks. Uh, well, I think it's, it's definitely both of us and an army of people. And I think um, it, starts with a, it starts with a vision of collaboration through science. Um, and that's that there, there are multiple different layers, right? So before we even get to the QCRG, there are all these other collaborations. There are through universities, institutes, industry, or pharma. Uh, diplomatic relations and all of that. So on the more administrative side of collaborations, our QBI administrative team will handle that with, with me at the head, but multiple people. We have project managers, we have administrators, we have people in finance, we have people in legal. And so all of these are pushing through all the various things that we need to formalize some of these relationships. As far as the QCRG is concerned, I'll let Nevin speak more about it, but that too follows the same sort of pattern where there's a vision and it starts with the science and the desire to push that forward. And that also has obviously project managers and all of the support staff with it. But I'll let Nevin explain a bit more about the vision behind QCRG and how that comes together. Well, I think, so that was a great, what I think what I would just add here is that you can't just snap your fingers and get hundreds of scientists working together immediately. So what, you know, Jacqueline has been working very hard with at QBI over the last three, four years is setting up the infrastructure uh, to facilitate the collaborations, the collaborations amongst the laboratories uh, at UCSF. Uh, she talked about the international relationship building across different ins institutions around the world, and then also connections between uh, pharmaceutical companies, which we've established as well over uh, the last few years. So I would argue um, in the context of this QCRG, we were in the perfect position to respond by bringing together all these different partners um, who we spent a lot of time with over the last uh, several years. So in that regard, it was very exciting to see all of this come together. And as I said before, the challenge now is to make this sustainable um, and, and help change the system so that collaboration uh, is encouraged and rewarded instead of uh, discouraged uh, going forward. I think Gary's got a follow-up. Um, he, he says, but who chooses fruitful approaches and judges dead-end approaches? That's that that is real. That's Brian's job. <laughs> <laughs> no, could I add a little? Oh, go ahead, Jacqueline. No, I just want to say so prior to the pandemic, um, I don't come from science, but obviously now I'm, a, I'm the biggest fan. But I think there's a tremendous amount of joy and fun in science. And so part of it is exploring. And that said, sometimes an idea comes up of people who are working on somewhere in some remote part of the world and you're curious about it, which I think is the cornerstone of science. And therefore, you reach out and you see if they're interested, and then you start a dialogue there. And that usually leads to some sort of invitation for a seminar and a dialogue. And if that in, in and of itself is, starts to bear fruit, then you start looking at deepening that relationship by formalizing it in one way or another. And I think what I'd add to that, Gary, on a more serious note, I think it's a great comment and question related to, to, to Jacqueline's answer is that 
the beauty of this is that we, we don't really have to decide the best approaches. It's, it's integrating together uh, a number of different approaches. Uh, and if you look at QCRG, we brought together systems biologists, chemical biologists, structural biologists, uh, computational scientists, virologists, and, and then ultimately now clinicians. So it's not about exclusion, it's about inclusion and exploring how to connect all these different pieces together in, in the best way. And to me, that's probably the, uh, Cable will probably like this, is to, for me to say this, this is truly what systems biology is, right? Is, is making these connections across all these different disciplines in, in a, a very um, exciting way uh, that you've seen here as we've studied COVID-19. Yeah, it's sort of like the opposite of what happens often is looking under the lamppost. This allows us to look at everything that we can grab in a very high resolution way and then dig into the different neighborhoods of the map and, and really find the best experiments and you know sort of the, the most intriguing hypotheses to test and then uh, it's on a lot of these zoom calls where we brainstorm and, and think of experiments and it's just great to have wonderful collaborators that are willing to uh to share in that curiosity discovery Thank you, everyone. We are going to uh, wind down now, let you uh, walk out of the room and uh, have a pleasant, pleasant evening. Stay safe, um, be wise, and hopefully you stay healthy. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Stay well, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.